I am going to go ahead and share my screen. Oh, I have to open the system preferences because I haven't shared my screen with Zoom since updating to Catalina. Yep, mm -hmm. I'm going to have to quit Zoom and rejoin, so I'll be right back. Okay, cool. Sorry about the little hiccup there. Um, I am recycling some slides that I've used in a previous presentation, so we won't actually get to that last bullet tonight. We're uh, implementing a simple autonomous service-based system, but the other um, bullet points there are legit. Um, whenever I talk about this stuff, I don't like to assume any prior knowledge, so we'll do the fire hose version of what I mean when I'm talking about my services and then um, we'll see how the components in such a system communicate with one another and then we take the first steps into modeling such a system which is the real goal of tonight and I really don't want that part of it to be lecture style so I've got a lucid chart document that I will dump into the chat and when we get to the actual modeling part um, hopefully if I did lucid chart right everyone will be able to actually edit that document in real time um, so, uh, <clears throat> standard introduction kind of stuff. Who am I? I'm Ethan. I've been around the Node.js meetup here for a couple of years now. I'm a co-organizer emeritus, um, but I help companies build microservice-based systems. I currently do that as the head of data architecture at Brigade Commercial Mortgage. And um, we are actually hiring for a principal engineer role right now. So if you're interested in that or know someone who is, let's talk. Um, and I always say this, I wrote a book, but so many times I've said, I've been writing it, but this time I have, it's done. It's in print and everything. And that's pretty exciting. Uh, that's a long project, but um, what we talk about tonight is uh, a lot of similar stuff in the book there. So monolith versus microservice. Uh, here is an example of a monolith. This is a user's table from a, uh, a local company that, bless their hearts, made their flagship product open source. So we can look at it and pick it apart. Um, what makes it a monolith is just look at the sheer diversity of data stored in this user object and try to think like, how do these go together? For example. Ethan, I just, wanna, I just wanna say I've worked with that and it's a mess. I was on the mobile team. Okay. Uh, meeting the mobile team and interfacing with that monolith was, was a mess. Fair enough. I, I worked briefly there as well back in 2014. I was also on the mobile team um, before leaving, but as an API developer for it is what I was doing. Um, and I, I totally do not share this to pick on any particular company. Rails begets architectures like this. Um, so anyway, I would love to ask this question and no one's been able to come up with a non-contrived example, but what operation requires transactional consistency between a user's storage quota and their time zone? Like what behavior in the system depends on knowing both of those things up to date at the same time. And I really struggle. I have not come up with one myself and and sharing this with other people, no one else has come up with an example where those two pieces of data have anything to do with each other. And that is the essence of a monolith where it's, I am modeling this by data, not by behavior. And so then, any behavior tangentially related to the data ends up being on the same class. If that database definition looks rough, I mean, Josh, you can speak to this. Imagine the code class that this is backing. Uh, it was some 3,000 lines long last I looked at it, and that wasn't from comments in white spaces. Yeah, so the, it was very the, the user object in particular kind of had its hand in everything. As, yeah. as you said, I mean, it's part of the Ruby on Rails monolithic approach. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I like this video. I've heard it kind of works over video, but this is a game called The Bubble Game. It's on Congregate if you want to play it. Anyway, my daughter helped me make this to illustrate how monoliths work. But imagine that the empty circle is the user class in a monolith, and then the full circles there, those are every other 
concern in the whole system. And it kind of works like this and wait for it. Finally, boom, that's what the user class ends up doing. That played really smoothly on my side. I don't know how it worked for you, but hopefully what you saw was the one circle just got bigger and bigger and swallowed everything. It was great, Ethan. Perfect illustration. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So, you know, it becomes painful to work on systems like that. And you go to the blogosphere for help and they say extract microservices. And so we're like, okay, let's do that. Here's my monolith. Um, overly dramatic spaghetti wires there that I've put because that's all running in one process. Those are function calls because that's how things in the same process generally talk to one another. And I'm like, okay, well, let's pull out the users and make a user's microservice. And I do the same thing and I pull out products and make a product microservice. And I have accomplished nothing. Not quite accurate. I've actually made things worse because what were function calls before, those are now HTTP calls. Um, I have yet to talk to someone who would rather deal with HTTP calls than function calls, all else being equal. And so now this is more painful, more ops requirements, more that can fail, et cetera, et cetera. And where it gets even nicer though, is that um, suppose that the user's so-called service is down. Suppose a request is coming in to change the price of a plasma screen to one cent. I probably want to verify who is trying to do that and not just let it occur. But if users happens to be down, that means products happens to be down and essentially the whole system is down. They can put in countermeasures for that short circuiting and so forth to make that less painful. But at the end of the day, I haven't separated anything really. All I've done is put it on a different server. And so then that begs the question, or what defines microservice then? The principal thing that defines a microservice is autonomy. And by autonomy, I mean no one asks a service for anything. We have things architecturally that we ask questions of. We call those databases. And a database is a database still, even if it's a single table behind an HTTP endpoint. Um, some databases ship with the ability to serve responses over HTTP. Um, my understanding is that Oracle can do that, and so can SQL Server. CouchDB can do that. But HTTP doesn't make something a microservice. Um, services also don't ask other things for stuff. If they did, they wouldn't be autonomous anymore because that would be a dependency on that thing. And a really neat caveat, or a, oh my gosh, what's the term? Corollary, that's what I'm looking for. These other two points is that um, they're oblivious to the existence of other things, which if we were getting more into the technical side of the services, we could dive into how that's nice and stuff, really cool properties you get. So um, given that a service is autonomous, you won't find web APIs in them. So if something has an express server in it, it's probably not a service. Um, they're not databases, they don't have get APIs. And like I said before, they aren't database tables behind a web API which is what the user's so-called service in that example was. And um, so I like to liken it to this. Um, here's a slide with a picture of puppies. I like puppies, they're wonderful, delightful creatures. And the blogosphere's advice to just extract services from a monolith is kind of like saying, well, just extract the kittens from this slide. Problem, of course, there are no kittens in this slide, so how do I extract any of them? Similarly, there are no services in a standard monolith. So if I want to get to a services architecture, I'm in for some painful refactoring. Sounds like from the introduction, some of you are already aware of that. So that's probably not news. Um, one of the big things, big shockers to me when I got into services development and system design was I came up through web development with a spaghetti PHP code and then got into Ruby on Rails, which introduced some structure. And I thought application database, like that was it. That was web development. Turns out there's actually a much bigger world to it than just an application and a database. Um, this is a graphical representation of the kinds of pieces we'd find in a service-based system. Some of them I'm not naming, and you're probably just sitting there on the edge of your seats wondering what could those boxes be? Um, we'll get to there. Put a number of constraints on services there. So you might be wondering, how do they talk to one another? Um, they do it through asynchronous messages. And those come in two flavors, commands and events. 
And events are the ones with past tense names because events are records of things that have happened. Um, much like things in reality that have happened, we can't really argue with them. They just are facts, they exist. We don't like the current state of things. We can issue commands to change, but we can't just ignore the fact that say a video was published. We want to unpublish it. We have to do something to make it unpublished. Kind of like in your bank account, if there is an erroneous transaction, they don't just delete it. They issue a compensating transaction that in effect undoes the previous one. And then oftentimes that will be followed by a correct transaction to do what you actually wanted to do. As the system designer, and this is what we'll do later on tonight, um, we come up with what these commands and events are. That's our responsibility as the system designers. And of course, I think everyone on this call works in development. We don't do that in isolation, though we will tonight because I don't think we have any subject matter experts on hotels with us tonight. But in a real world situation, if we were gonna do this, we would wanna get, we're gonna model a hotel front desk application. And if we were gonna actually do that, we would invite people who actually work at a hotel front desk and any other subject matter expertise we needed. We'd invite UI UX people. And of course we would have representation from development there as well. Um, we organize these messages into what we call streams. Those are just um, logical boundaries that we put around things. So um, all of the events in a given stream make up all the state for the particular thing in that stream. So in this case, we have video dash some identifier. Usually use UUIDs for that, but they don't fit very well horizontally on a screen. So we're saying that some video with identifier 84, blah, blah, blah. Um, its current state is that it was published and that it received a name. Um, over here, we have a command stream. So this is not state, but command streams are used to transport commands to a service. And this one here is for a hypothetical email service. We draw boundaries around streams and that's what a service boundary is. So if we had a video publishing service, um, it's the only thing that's allowed to write to video streams. It's the only thing that's allowed to process messages in the video colon command streams. That's the video publishing services boundary. And we can do a similar thing for the email service. It is authoritative over events related to emails. So it gets, sorry, I just wanted to labor this point one little bit. Um, to be authoritative over the streams here over videos. Again, it means it's the only thing that writes to event streams that are in what we call the category video. And it's the only thing that reacts to commands written to video colon command category streams. Um, the idea is that anything in the system can write a command to this service, but only it can write the events that result from those commands. To violate that rule, is like crossing the streams in the Ghostbuster sense, and all of the same evils will pursue from it if you do that. So then to give actual names to the pieces of the system, um, we have our happy users, we have applications. That's where your express servers live or in the Ruby world, Rails servers would live. Um, they write commands and sometimes events to what we call a message store which is a database optimized for storing messages. Um, it differs from something like Kafka in that Kafka is more of a transport, a buffer, whereas a message store is a durable storage. And then we have the services. Um, I will probably at this point going forward refer to them as components, autonomous components. I always represent them with lightning bolts because lightning bolts are action packed. They are the doers of things. They carry out the business processes um, we have aggregators. Why? Well, we're storing state as the sequences of events. That's what event sourcing is. The overall architecture is more accurately called pub sub, so publish subscribe, if you're familiar with that. Um, because we're using pub sub, we can store state as events. However, lists of events are not always useful when showing screens to users. 
they're awesome in say a bank account history page or an audit log, but not every view is one of those two things. So the role of an aggregator then is it consumes events and reshapes them into what we call view data. Um, if you're familiar with domain driven design, you might have heard the term read model, similar idea. Um, so it just reshapes it into something that makes sense for whatever we're trying to show our users. Um, view data, you can store that in a regular old relational database. You can put it into Elasticsearch. You really can do whatever you want with it. You could generate static HTML pages and have people download those. Uh, the sky is the limit, but of course, every different way of doing things you put into a system, that's additional operational overhead and um, just more moving pieces. Um, and now that magical thing in the middle, that's called the message store. I'm gonna skip the what things are trickier. Okay, I'm gonna stop there with the, the fire hose stuff. Any questions there before we proceed to actually modeling a system this way? So one of the things that I've been thinking about in uh, attempting to pursue something of this sort, and I think you were just talking about it, Ethan, is like if I've got commands coming in, many times uh, things, services that I have will need to not edit, but they'll need to read or know the state of, uh, they'll need access to some of that view data to be able to take action on something. If I'm strictly using, uh, if I were to just do essentially get events that said, hey, I need to read that information, that would be silly. Um, and I'd have a whole bunch of things stacked up in there. How do you differentiate uh, between when you need an event to communicate and when, and when you should use something else? Um, that's a good question. So um, I will say a hard, fast rule that a, an autonomous component would never use view data to carry on what it does. Um, so you get into where you have a, the difference between a push-based system or a pull-based system. And so if there is some data, a service, a component should have in its event stream all the data it needs to make a decision. And the way you get that, so when we get to the event modeling, we are going to come up with events and we're going to see what data is in those events. And then based on what that data is, after that is when we start dividing that into component boundaries because it's the data that informs us what data belongs together. Sorry, it's the operations we're trying to perform uh, represented through the series of events that tells us what those boundaries should be. However, there are some times where you need some input from something else and that's where a command comes into play uh, in a push-based system. So I could, when I send a command to a component, if there's other data it needs to consider, um, I would put that into the command that gets sent in. Um, in a worst case scenario, we could have a component um, essentially observing events put out by other components. And so they can read those from the message door when they need. But um, anytime we do something based on a query, that's immediately stale, potentially. Is that answering your question? I mean, there's, it's a case by case kind of thing. But um, the goal to get the autonomy, that's why it's so important to get those boundaries right and why we do things like the modeling we're gonna to do tonight is to get the boundaries right so that as a component, when I receive a command, say to act on a video that's in the system, I already have within the stream any data that I would need to properly handle the command that I'm receiving. I think that certainly answers the question. I'll have to think about what it would actually mean to apply that in practice. Okay, we'll get some hands-on work with that tonight. Um, the process that I use to do just that, it's not the only way to do it, but um, it does require heftier analysis than what we would do in the MVC world, for sure. Any other questions? Okay, then I'm gonna move on. Um, let's see here. So we're gonna move on to 
event modeling. Um, in the intro of my book, I put in there that there is uh, a difference between principles and particular implementations of those principles. And one of my biggest fears was that people would read it and then be like, oh, the way this code is laid out in this book, this is how microservices are done. It's a way to do microservices, and that's the only claim I make in there. Um, so a similar thing about event modeling, if you're gonna build a system this way, I don't know of a sane way to avoid designing it beforehand and figuring out what the events are supposed to be and doing that in conjunction with subject matter experts. Event modeling is a way to do that. It is a way that we've had some success with at work. And I probably undersell it when I say some success. It has had a radical impact on the way we build things. It has been super useful in getting products and UI UX and development to be sure that we're talking about the same thing. It's a very visual representation of stuff. And um, I wouldn't say we strictly follow it exactly either. We've made our own few conventions, but basically event modeling is a system formalized by Adam Dimitruk. Um, at the time I made these slides, I had never met Adam, but I have since met him and asked him how he pronounces his last name. And he said, Dimitruk is how he says it. Um, great, that little pop-up just covered the URL. But um, at eventmodeling.org, there's a series of blog posts there. And there's one, what is event modeling? It's fantastic reading. It's probably like 20, 25 minutes of reading. So obviously we won't do that here. But he goes through a lot of the benefits and step-by-step -step how it works. And it's a fantastic read. But what it basically comes down to is seven steps. We are only gonna look at six of them, um, where there's brainstorming, putting them in temporal order, there's the storyboard, identifying inputs, and then outputs, and then that's where we finally get our component boundaries. And so this is the point at which we jump over and put it in the Zoom chat. Where did chat go? Chat, here we go. Okay, so if I did this right, clicking on that link, you should be able to join the doc and even edit it. So I am seeing people, this is great. Yay, hi everybody. So the basic building blocks that we have to work with, oh, there's a few. If you ever do this in Lucid Chart, um, if you come up with no object selected through the arrow and click curve, that will default all the arrows to curved. It makes these kinds of diagrams a lot easier to read. And so I'll also default the text to the upper left, but whatever. Okay, so we have a few basic building blocks. So we work, we have events, obviously, and this is arbitrary but fixed. That's roughly the color they use for it. What color you use doesn't matter, but I do think there's value in being consistent in organization. Um, uses blue for commands. And then uh, roughly this shade of green for view data. Although in his documentation, he'll call that a uh, read model. Um, he's uh, a practitioner of domain-driven design. I'm not, I think it's a lot of ceremony that's not necessary in most cases. Um, so I'm not here to have poo poo all over it, but just I haven't found use in it. If you do, awesome. So those are our basic building blocks. And then we also have very low fidelity representations of UI elements. And because I'm only on the basic Lucid chart plan, we don't get all the fantastic UI mockup tools that they have, but if you're on the enterprise plan, you do get all of that. So there's just some extra work to do to fake it. So like, check this out. There is an input box, yay. Um, so what generally happens in a system like this is the way they operate is you get some command, and this view data could also be what's called a projection. There's a slight nuance in what they are. I don't think we really need to cover it. But a command comes in, a projection gets generated, some number of events gets 
written out as a result of that, usually one. And then I am drawing a complete blank on what goes here, but the cycle repeats. Very circular. Stimulus comes in, decide how to act on it, write the results, and that's what a component does. That's its whole existence, is just carrying that on and on and on and on. What event modeling is doing is taking this circle and laying it out in time and showing what the specific interactions are. So let me, I will cut to the event modeling uh, site to show a quick example of that. So keep that circular flow in your head and then I don't need to zoom in because we don't really need to read it, but you'll see the flow that like, here's the UI, here's a command, an event comes from that, which generates view data, which populates a UI. And so you can kind of imagine it as a sine wave going through there. And so we're always moving forward in time with this. We don't want to see arrows going backwards. That's one of the constraints of event modeling. And what the big benefits that we'll see as we get into this are, um, we can see every piece of data that's used in this flow. We can see where it came from. Did it originate in the UI? Did it originate from some other part of our system, et cetera, et cetera. And that gives us what's called information completeness. And as an anecdote from work, I was working with a team and they were doing one of these diagrams for their system. And they had this one screen with this one section on it with the most critical data they were gonna show on that screen. And they're like, oh, we have no idea where this data is coming from. And they got to find that out a couple of hours into doing an event model, rather than several sprints into developing this and finding out they didn't have the data. So um, it's not like, I know we all fear waterfalls. So we're not talking that an event model should take a year and then we can start building. Um, in practice for a significant feature, two to three days is a reasonable amount of time to spend on these. And enough setup, why don't we actually get into it? Um, so back at the lucid chart diagram, we are, convention I use is I'll make a, what will I make? One that looks like the sticky notes. Okay, lucid chart tip. If you use the actual sticky note, it has to be a square. I've not found a way to make it not a square. I don't like that, so I just color a regular old box the same as if it were a sticky note so that I can have it not be a square. Anyway, so we're gonna do a hotel check-in application. So what do I mean by that? It is for the folks who work at the front desk and you walk up to the desk because you wanna get checked into your room. And this is a very simple hotel. So we have like actual metal keys on the wall behind the, um, what do you call the person, the host who stands at the front of the hotel in the lobby? I don't know, we're gonna call that person the host. Um, there's three types of rooms we could have. Um, I'm totally cribbing this from a training I went to with Adam Dimitruk, and we we're imagining it as like Bob's Rustic Inn. So there's like, only three kinds of rooms, kind of a low tech place. Maybe it has Wi-Fi, maybe it doesn't, um, but no fancy key cards or anything. Um, but people have to pay for their rooms in advance. They book them online. That would happen somewhere in this system, but obviously not right at check-in. And our job is to build an application that will allow the host to check someone in and also check them out. Um, some things we'll have to worry about is um, scheduling maintenance. We'll have to schedule housekeeping. And yeah, that's kind of vague somewhat intentional because I want to prompt questions. One of the greatest sins we can commit as developers 
is to make assumptions about what we're building. And so I really want to force conversation about what we're doing. Um, and this is where we start listing out the events. So let's kind of talk through it in this sense. We'll kind of prime it as a group and then y'all can dive in and start working on it. So let's just start from the first screen. Imagine that you're the host at a hotel. What would you expect to see on a screen when people are walking up to you? Maybe some kind of uh, table of people who are uh, have reservations for that day. Love it. Yeah, let's call it a list because um, maybe we represent it as a table. Maybe we don't. Sure. But um, so list of reservations. That seems reasonable to me. We don't have to get too detailed on what that actually looks like. So now I can drag over a view data box here. And what I'm going to show is that this screen here is populated by this bit of view data, which is the output of an aggregator. But at this stage, we're, we're not talking tech specific tech solutions. This is all conceptual. So I'm going to call that the reservation list. What data would I need to be able to populate this screen? I mean, I, I guess this would the be the person. Yeah. Yeah, the, the person's name. So Day let me. Room. So the room one's an interesting one. It didn't occur to me when I first tackled this either, is they're not actually assigned a room until they check in. They've booked to get a room, but part of the check in process is assigning them a room. So we'll leave that one off for now because that'll be an action that we take. <laughs> later on in the thing, but you said the date. So like the anticipated check-in date, check-in date. Maybe the type of room they've reserved. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I'll call that room type because we have the three types of rooms. Maybe something about their payment. Yeah, so I'd call that like the booking number because that'll have a reference to however they booked it. Yeah, these are good. Um, that's a good start. We This is a malleable document, and even after we quote unquote finish, we'll come back to it in the future. But I hope what you're starting to see is like we're explicitly calling out what the data is. So we've got this few data, that's great. Where does it come from? <laughs> Right? Uh, if we're getting into information completeness, we need to say, okay, great. Here's a view that we want. How do we get that? And in a system like this, where does all of our state come from? So aggregated events? Exactly, exactly, events. So um, one of the conventions in event modeling, and I like it, is we are eventually going to issue commands that will trigger new events, but sometimes, there are events that come from other portions of the system and we still want to represent those. So I call those precursor events. If we were modeling out the entirety of a hotel software package, we would probably have a very large event model that includes um, where the customer is booking, um, some sort of an admin screen for us as the hotel operators to do admin tasks. There um, would be some payment processing going on, but we don't have to show the mechanics of those as long as we can represent the events that those processes would produce. That's one of the brilliant things that comes out of a pub sub architecture like this is we get these event contracts. And so if we can agree on what the events are, I can develop my system without you having your part done. And then when your part is done, you turn it on and it works because the only stimulus I ever get is these messages. And I don't genuinely know if they're coming from an actual component or application you've developed 
or if they're coming from a test harness or if I'm just typing them into the database manually, right? I have no concept of where these are actually coming from. I just know how to respond to them. So we have precursor events over here. Um, an example of that might be um, someone booked a reservation. And I would probably give that a booking number. Um, that would probably have a room type on it because that would be what the person did. Um, might have a customer ID on there. Want to be mindful of things like personally identifiable information. So um, rather than passing around the actual details, the identifiable information, pass around IDs wherever I can. Um, if they booked it, then there might be a payment ID from the provider. I think that like if you use Stripe, each transaction gets a unique identifier. I'd want to record that. Um, probably the amount and when it happened, stuff like that. But the way that I then show how this fits into the model is I draw an arrow from that event to the view. This, of course, is not the only event that I would need for this. Um, thinking back to the admin application that I would have, I probably need to control my inventory. So I'd have. Um, Actually, I wouldn't need that at this point yet. Well, maybe I would, whatever. I'll just put this on here and have like a room type and then um, the number associated with that room. And yeah, we'll just leave it at that. So that's an event that could have come from the admin portion of this whole system. Okay, so that, this is a start. I haven't connected this yet because I don't know if we actually need this event for this view, but this will come into play in a later view. But let's continue then driving this from the user interface. Uh, if I've got a list of reservations, so like I see that Ethan has a room book for today, he's probably going to leave next week, so there would be an anticipated, anticipated check out date because you know sometimes people leave early or late um, so I've got a list that's on there what might I do with said list so you're the the host and I walk up and say hi I've got a reservation this is my name um, what would you expect to do next check them in and assign them a room yeah, probably not gonna do that from this screen. Um, so this is where I wish I did have the enterprise account where I could have better looking buttons, but maybe there's a check-in button. Check in. Oh, come on, son. There we go. Of course, I wanted a space there. Let's drag this into place. There is nothing as exciting as watching someone else use Lucidchart in real time. So like double bonus for you all tonight. Um, a really nice convention that Adam came up with is that um, sometimes you have a UI transition that doesn't actually affect the state of the system. And so the way that he represents that is just get that next UI screen up there. So this could be the list of available rooms and we'll just draw an arrow directly from there to there. So that is just pure navigation. Nothing actually changed in the system. So if we're gonna check you in, I need to assign you a room. So that means that I need to have a list of what rooms are available to assign you to. Um, and what do I use to populate a UI screen? Any takers from what we saw in the, the architectural diagram? So this will be another view. Exactly, yeah. So I'll just bring this over here and I'll name this the available rooms list. That's going to be a room that probably has a room number. And depending on how we want to do this, like we might say, oh, well, we could project when the room is going to be available based on when housekeeping will be done. Um, but this is a rustic cabin in the woods that you probably wouldn't want to stay at because you'd be afraid of being murdered. 
which gives us a nice simple model that we have to make. So let's just say there's the room number and we don't, we don't even care about things like um, how many occupants a room can have. You book a room, we'll tell you how many people would fit comfortably in there and then you bring the whole crew if you want to or not. I don't know, that's not what we're worried about for purposes of showing how event modeling works. So we're gonna assign you to a room. I'd probably need the, the list would have room numbers. Um, maybe that screen would wanna have the person's name again. I don't know, that might be a nice thing so we don't lose context so we could put that name back in there. Um, so here's where this event would come into play, right? Because the room's not available if we've never added it to our inventory. Um, there's probably going to be housekeeping related rooms. So when someone checks out, um, there'd be some event because it can't be available unless someone has checked out of the room. So we'd have the room number and um, I'm just going to put date. I'd probably give that a more specific name, but that's when they checked out. So that might actually be a time. Uh, right, because then that could be used to bill them for checking out late as well. Um, what other events would I need to know about to be able to populate a list of available rooms? Is it enough that a person just checked out like as soon as someone checks out, can I assign that room to somebody else? I mean, you'd probably want to to trigger some kind of housekeeping action first. Absolutely, yeah. So um, at some point that will be completed. So what would we name that? Like housekeeping performed or house kept? Something in the past tense. Give me some ideas here on what we could name this event. That represents that the housekeeping has been performed. I mean, just that simple housekeeping performed. Housekeeping performed, room cleaned maybe, I don't know. We'd have the room number and when that happened. So that's actually an event that would play into whether or not a room is available. Um, I might have taken it out of commission because there's some maintenance in the room that needs to happen. So maybe there's a maintenance scheduled event somewhere, the room number, I guess when it got scheduled and this is a terrible data name, but what needs to happen? That's just kind of a, a loosey goosey name to represent what we're asking the maintenance crew to do. So that's the kind of thing that would make a room available. And then hopefully at some point that finishes. So the maintenance, um, keeping with the convention above, we could say the maintenance was performed. And that would just be the room number and when it got done. So figuring out how long it takes a room to be serviced. Uh, apparently my internet connection is on and so let me know if I'm dropping out or if you need me to repeat something. Uh, this is where the lucid charting in real time gets painful. Um, I would take the time to make this prettier under normal circumstances, but but are you starting to get, to get a feel of how I start with the experience that I want to deliver. I identify what data needs to exist to deliver that experience. And then I figure out where that data is coming from. Is that making sense so far? Any questions? Yeah. So, um, I think I'm following so far. So the gist is, um, we'll create the, you know, the, the commands and events and everything and then group them together. And those will become our, our service boundaries or our components to, I guess, use the, the parlance we've adopted here. That's right. Um, okay. And I actually, uh, jumped way ahead. 
Um, this is probably not the best introduction. What we actually should have done, and this is the way I conducted at work. I guess I tried to condense it because our time is so limited. Um, step one would be really just listing out what are the things that can occur. Um, so if we're talking about the hotels, we just have a big old brainstorming session. We'd be like, oh, someone needs to book a room. Someone makes a reservation on a room. Their payment is processed. Um, they check out, the housekeeping has been performed. Uh, so if we actually followed the thing that I said we were gonna follow, we would have done it in this order, just list out the events, put them into rough order, and then the storyboard is where we would start adding the UI screens that show where the things happen. Um, so apologies, didn't go that direction, but I do think there is value in that, especially when you're newer to the process but um, I can't undo the past. That is an event that has already been emitted. So, okay. Um, the next step then is we've got this list of available rooms. It's gonna, oh, that's what I always do with Lucid Chart. I duplicate too many things. So we have this list of available rooms and some button here where I'm going to assign the room. Yes, I probably would need the name and the um, booking. What do we call that earlier? The booking number? Because I'd come to a screen that has in its context who I'm assigning to the room. And then I'd click assign on there. And this is where we would introduce a command. Because now that's something that's changing the state of my system. Because this room that was available is no longer going to be available. So that's where I show a command being written here. And if I were going to assign a room to someone, what might I name this command? The hint being it's in the imperative mood. Any suggestions? Assign room. Yeah, sorry, it's, it's kind of a silly question because it is, we want to use the language of the subject matter experts. And so I will go to great lengths to avoid using the words create, update, or delete. I would absolutely use them if we were modeling databases because that is domain language for databases, but it's not really domain language for a hotel. You don't create rooms in a hotel because what you're saying is if I had a create room event, what I'm saying is that at that moment, the room was constructed. That's not what I'm representing. I'm representing it, adding it to my inventory. So yeah, I would say assign room. And through that, I would need to have the room number, um, probably have the customer ID in there because I'd wanna know who's in my rooms. Um, don't really need the booking number at that point to just uh, assign the room. Um, we might find more data is needed from that. If all goes well with this event, which mostly they do, then what I end up with then is then the past tense version of the command and I'll change the color to match the convention there. And then I would just represent that this command triggers this event, I'm probably gonna copy at least the same data there. I'll probably want um, an ID to represent the act of attempting to assign this room. That uh, is useful when we start talking about item potents, which we don't in an event model, but if you wanna know about that, ask me about it later. Um, I'll probably, have the time that I did that. So, um, I don't know, assigned at. And now the room is assigned. So I can then give the key to the person and they can go get into their awesome rustic scenery room. Um, so then I continue on modeling the flow that would occur. 
uh, at some point they're going to leave the hotel. List. Oh man, I forgot the word of over here as well. Ah, whatever. Okay, I'm just going to let go of perfect typing for right now. And I will bring copies of these over here. And I want to, oh, what happened? Maybe I let go of the copy button or something. Okay. Now it's saved. That's great. So I want to be able to check out somebody. UIs, of course, are always populated from view data. So I'll need a list of occupied rooms. Oops. List of occupied rooms. I would have the room number, maybe the person's number. Do I need the booking number? Maybe. Further analysis will refine that. Obviously in half an hour, it's gonna look different than if we actually spend a day or two on this. Um, but I might have the anticipated check out date involved there. Cause that'll let me know if this person's late or not. But um, this event would certainly feed that view, right? Cause when someone's assigned, that's when they show up on the occupied rooms list. Um, I would do some wizardry here to connect all of these without making it too busy. These can get, do you have to play some gymnastics to make them work? Finally, if you go to settings and come down here to lines and click that, then when lines cross, you get the little loop so that it's easier to follow them. Um, so the occupied rooms, if someone checked out, that would affect that view because that would be an indication that they left. Um, so that one's kind of a precursor event as well as one that shows up in Airflow. So check out, um, probably put, well, I wouldn't need a separate identifier there. There'd be the room number, the customer. ID. But I even need the customer ID to check someone out of a room. I don't think so. We're just saying that whoever is there now, they're leaving. Maybe I would need that. I don't know. I'm not a hotelier myself. But from this screen, then I would have the connection showing that. And then that would, of course, result in a checked out event. And we are bumping up against time already. Um, this is the basic process. Um, it's just a, a visual representation of the story that occurs in my system. So we're starting to see that sine wave occur. So UI comes down to command to event to view, back up to UI to command and event. And I'm trying to think. Uh, there are other things that would be worth covering, like how do you deal with failures? Um, suppose that for some reason, this checkout failed. The way we do that is, that's okay. Let's just say that the checkout was rejected. For some reason, from our business rules, we said, nope, that one's not happening. We could put a reason in there that can feel, I'm gonna get real loosey-goosey here all of a sudden because we don't have the time to be more detailed, but that could feed into something that has the reason why it failed. So then I can show some error screen to the person at the front desk that contains reason it failed. And those are connected and then later on, maybe I just navigate them back to the screen. So, oh, let's grab the extra arrow. Every time, like I know people say every time sometimes and they don't literally mean it. I do, I swear every time I go to duplicate something, I duplicate two things. And so I'll just repeat the screen and I would also repeat the view that's populating that screen, but I'm just showing that like, okay, great error. Now I move to some screen where I can try to check them in again. 
And this time, I guess it's not every time where I do the duplication, but um, maybe this time it worked. So what I'm doing is trying to talk and type at the same time. So both turn out more awkward than they would individually. But I am building the failures explicitly into my flow, showing how they happen, showing what data is associated with them. So here's kind of where the payoff comes in nice, is that, um, and Adam talks about this in the blog post, is I can, I wouldn't actually represent this in the drawing itself, but I'm gonna show like taking a vertical slice here. Um, each one of these cycles through here of the sine wave, um, that is a use case in my system. So I can start dividing these up. I guess I should have caught this command with it as well. Right, so that's a, a unit, oh my goodness, I didn't want to bend the line, just move it over. That is a unit of work. That could be a user story in my issue tracker. And I can start to have a feel for how long implementing one of these takes. So that's gonna let me give more accurate estimates. Um, Adam talks about using this, to, like if you were hiring contractors to work on it, now you've got a very detailed description of what they should do. Um, I don't have any experience pushing this work off to contractors. But um, being able to develop these user stories helps me be more accurate in estimations. Um, one last thing I wanna cover is, um, let me get the high res version, I think that'll make it bigger. But um, you can actually start building your test cases from this. So let's see, we have someone has registered a room was added when the book room occurs. We would expect to see a room booked event. So we can list that explicitly given events that we've enumerated above. When this command comes in, then we expect to see that a room got booked. So that starts informing the test cases that we write to work with this. And he has additional examples of that up here. And so we can even do that with generating views of the data. Um, what we didn't get into, these gears here, that's like when there is a, an automated process that occurs. So in this case, um, like the payment processor, um, we requested that a payment occur. Something's gonna pick that up to wrap the interaction with whatever is actually charging people's cards. Um, yeah, that's the fire hose version of event modeling. Um, Thoughts, questions on that? Yeah, so one thing that I think would um, really help me anchor this is kind of discussing, I mean, how the rubber meets the road with this kind of thing. So the, the model makes sense, um, or the, the modeling process makes sense. As far as like the overall uh, system design that incorporates this. So what I'm taking away is that these, you know, components that uh, process the events you know, those are just going to be your traditional, you know, microservices in Node or C Sharp or whatever your, your stack is. Um, the, uh, as far as aggregators, what, what do those typically look like? You mentioned not considering Kafka like the, the correct uh, bus for these. And I know kind of the argument for Kafka is often that it is also queryable. What, what, does the aggregation into the view look like from like a, a tooling perspective? Great question. So I discourage Kafka as a message store. Uh, if all you're looking to do is move messages, I think Kafka is great. Um, Kafka fails as a message store for two reasons. One is it doesn't have optimistic concurrency. So you can't be like, I wanna write to this topic and I expect the topic to be at version X. That becomes really important when working in a PubSub based system like this. Um, Kafka doesn't support it, nor should it, because that's not what it's for. And then the other is that, uh, if I come back to the original slides, the original slides, the slides that I showed at the beginning, they're not like the original slides. Um, let's see here. So when we organize them into streams, um, 
what this is suggesting is that there is a separate stream for each video. And the analog to a stream in Kafka is a topic, but topics you have to make beforehand. And when you subscribe to Kafka, you have to tell it every topic that you want to subscribe to. And so there's a lot more difficulty in creating new topics. Whereas in a message store, um, I typically use, we didn't cover it, message DB uh, that it was made by the event type project, which is a Ruby toolkit for making microservices this way. Um, they split off the message store implementation for that. It just runs in Postgres. It's one table with some stored procedures and indexes that make it work quite nicely. Sensible use of stored procedures or user-defined functions, whatever the case may be. Um, there is a stream name column in that table. Anytime you write a message with a stream name that has not previously been written, that in effect creates a new stream. And so if I were trying to do that with Kafka topics, I'd essentially have to be able to predict, say, every user who would ever join my site before right. they did so. So um, those are the reasons why I don't think Kafka is a good choice for the event source autonomous microservices. It certainly has its place for what it's good at. Um, I just don't think that is its sweet spot. That said, so what is an aggregator? Um, if we were looking at the code for it, um, the code for an aggregator looks almost identical to the code for one of the components or the services. Let me come here. So code-wise, these are extremely similar. Um, what the real difference is that um, when these, these respond to commands and sometimes events, and what they do is usually, you know, they're always going to write events in response to whatever stimulus they're reacting to. So they add additional state to the system. Um, they may also carry out some other side effect like in my book with the video publishing component, um, it quote unquote transcodes videos. Um, it does it with a dummy function that says, hey, if you are actually transcoding, here's where that would go. Um, but so it might carry out some side effect and then also write an event about it. Um, aggregators only are handling events. They will never handle a command because commands aren't state. And there, what they do is say, if I were aggregating to a Postgres table, it's um, event handler would somehow trigger a query to update a Postgres database table. So that their structure is identical. It's just on um, what kinds of messages they consume are different. There's the restriction on the aggregator that it is only events. Um, aggregators may consume events from different streams, different categories of streams. That's the sense of aggregate. So let me see if I can bring this all home. At the very beginning, we talked about this very large table here. This table may very well exist in a system built the way that I would propose systems be built, but it is an aggregation of events from many different components. And that's totally appropriate in viewed data. Like in our own thing that we built here, to get this list of reservations, bad example, to get this list of available rooms, we're saying to construct this view, I'm actually taking events that probably are in different components. We haven't actually split them out into different components yet, but I doubt that the room inventory management is the same piece of the system that schedules housekeeping. That's probably gonna be different. That's okay, because I'm aggregating those together into a view. Um, so your question was, how does aggregation look? Um, almost exactly like the components, but what they do with the messages and what kinds of messages they can see are different. So is there any risk of like leaking out of like encapsulation and having to, you know, duplicate? I'm, I'm thinking the best way to phrase this here, but, you know, is, is there like a risk that, um, you know, you, you'd have to have room logic, you know, in both a, a room component and in the aggregators, if that makes sense, or is that not something that comes up in practice? Um, that is what we're trying to avoid. Um, so the components encapsulate behaviors in the system. And 
checking out is a behavior in the system, for example. So even room seems like too big of a thing to mm -hmm. have be a component, but the checkout process, that could be a component. And so um, I wouldn't expect to find checking out logic to be in more than one place. I, I don't consider aggregating the result of checking out to be checkout logic, but the actual thing that determines the state of the system, the logic that owns that would live in one place because that's a distinct behavior. And so we wouldn't want to see that behavior replicated in two places. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think I also need to get a little further in the book as well. But Okay. I will say as much as I love my book, um, it is very focused on the mechanics and the design aspect was pretty light in it. And that was space constraints essentially. Um, so if I were ever to do a follow-up, um, getting more into the design aspects is something I would do. Um, Adam is writing a book on event modeling. I'm not sure of its status, but he's been working on his for a while. Like I was working on mine for a while, it takes a long time, um, but it's worth following him because he'll tweet about how this works from time to time. And he's done a number of workshops, not unlike this one um, with various meetup groups online. Um, but so what my own can help with is um, showing the mechanics and the divisions of the components then what events are written by a particular component becomes dictated by what is needed to carry out that behavior. And so when I'm saying that checking out is probably a distinct process from housekeeping, don't really need the data from both of those to be available at the same time. Um, and that's what leads me to the Rails architecture, which puts all this unrelated data into the same thing. That's what we want to avoid. Identifiers are, in general, less risky to pass around than more specific information. In the system, we're using the room number as an identifier, not just a pure data element. Um, but that's like why when we got to checking out, we didn't need the um, customer ID anymore, because that's not an operation that really involves a particular customer that's an operation that occurs um it's a room concept not a customer concept right um i do have maybe another question though i don't want to hog the question time so i'll step back for just a second to see if anyone else wants to hop in um so i guess the other thing that i was curious about is so of course this this makes sense when you're at like a certain scale and have a certain complexity, right? Otherwise, this is a lot of overhead. Um, and a lot of the common advice for uh, early stage stuff is to just start writing a monolith, because otherwise, you know, you're you're incurring a lot of obligation to um, you know maintain stuff, and instead of you know writing the stuff that makes your product important, um, is there like a a good way of that you can like think of of structuring uh, uh, a monolithic application with you know easy seams and uh, to kind of facilitate a natural transition to this at a certain scale. Yeah, for sure. Um, Martin Fowler in particular has given that advice. Um, I disagree with Martin Fowler on that. Um, this is the way that I default to building a system. Um, the reason for it is that um, there, a monolith is not a stepping stone to a services architecture. Like you're probably experiencing it. I like to say I'm in Salt Lake. I wanna to get to New York. That's the services architecture. Building a monolith first is like driving to Las Vegas. Um, that's not moving me in the direction that I wanna to get to. Um, I think something like Rails is totally appropriate if I'm prototyping. Um, that said, yes, um, and uh, Adam actually has an article about this on eventmodeling.org, but even if I were going to not build separate components and I were going to build this into a single um, process, single database and all of that, I would still analyze the system this way. Um, the analysis is, doesn't take forever. It's not the same as it takes to actually implement this in code, but if I haven't done this analysis to discover what my boundaries should be, I've got no chance at implementing it with proper boundaries. 
Um, an example that the folks behind the event type project use a lot is, to represent a monolith is the products table in an e-commerce store. And they'll rightly show that the products table probably includes the domains of the product catalog, product inventory, and product pricing. Those are three separate concerns, but we were following the Rails architecture, we crammed them together in a single table. Having done an analysis like this, what will pop out is like, oh yeah, the catalog doesn't control pricing. I need to show the price on a screen, but the catalog is just, what is the product? What's its UPC? I don't know, what's its description? Uh, and that is independent from how I price it. Um, pricing is controlled by completely different concerns. Um, same with inventory, like the catalog, the description of it doesn't care about how many of them there are. So I do the analysis like that, those separate swim lanes, and I'm gonna say swim lane because um, that's how it's represented here, will show that those are separate. So then maybe that translates into three different tables in my system. I've got a catalog table, a pricing table, an inventory table, and then because I'm now in the same process, I can take advantage of transactions again, whereas in a system built like this, I don't have asset compliance anymore. I've given that up in the whole cap theorem thing. I've given up consistency for availability and partition tolerance. Um, so having done the analysis as if I were gonna build microservices, that informs how I would do my database design. Now, if at some point I'm like, okay, now we're gonna take this and actually build services, well, I actually have domains that I could extract. So, I mean, if you ask me what time it is, I'll tell you how to build a watch. I apologize, I'm long-winded in the answers. But um, I would still always analyze it this way. And that analysis will definitely change the way that I would build it if I were just putting everything together in the same relational database. Is that useful? Yeah, that's super useful, thanks. Okay. Any others? Okay, then I'm gonna go ahead and call it. Um, this was a fire hose thing. Um, in the real world, we were doing this in meat space. We'd have a big wall, we'd have posted notes, we'd have subject matter experts, and there's a, a nice energy that comes with that. Um, this does work remotely as well. Um, I do a lot of calls like this with teams since we've all shifted to remote because of the pandemic. Um, and we do get good collaboration going once people are familiar with sort of the primitives of how to do this. I like it because it's simple. You've probably heard of event storming. I think that one is very complex for what it's trying to do. This is simple to me. There's not a lot of primitives to learn. Um, just some simple concepts, and it's really just about telling the story of what the system does. When I see that story, then when I go to implement it, like these probably become the messages that I code into the system. These become the data points, and um, it really has transformed the way that we build stuff at Bercadia because of the power of its communication. And one last thing, and then I'll shut up. Um, this becomes a living document. And so as you're sharing it with people, people might come in and grab one of these and be like, hey, why is this like blah? And you can ask questions and you can answer them right there. And now you've got this history of the decisions that were made and why they were made. And um, communication is the hardest part of building software. I'm convinced of that. And the more explicit we can be in the communication, I find a lot of value in that. And so hopefully the concepts here can help you. Um, I'm on Twitter, Ethan Garfolo. If you ever want to talk more, I'm happy to do that. Um, I love this stuff. And um, just be careful if you get me going because it might not stop. So <laughs> thanks for coming, everybody. Yeah, thanks for sharing. This has been really cool. You bet. And also big thanks to OC Tanner. I don't know if anyone here is from OC Tanner, but um, even when we're not there in person, they're still providing the means for us to have this meetup. So that is super awesome of y'all.
Cool. Well, thanks again. I'm going to drop off. Okay. Have a great evening. You too. See you, Jack. So, Aaron, Baton, back to you, or is uh, Devin still on the call? Oh, Devin had to drop too. Aaron, if you're talking, you're on mute. Okay, well, maybe he's not there. Um, I am also gonna drop, I just got a phone call from my wife that I ignored. Um, so I'm gonna give her a call back and yeah, see y'all around. Those watching the recording who are still here, um, thanks for coming. I was indisposed for a moment and uh, it's been good to see you. Have a good evening.